to get ahead of 99% of software engineers, you have to act like the top 1%. And I've worked with them. I sat next to Kent Beck at Gusto. I've been yelled at by the first engineer at JetBrains. And my now good friend is a Circle CI legend. And today I'm gonna spill all their secrets broken into eight key areas, starting with secret number one, thrive and ambiguity. Most software engineers cannot function without direction. They sit around waiting for projects or even worse, individual tasks. It's one thing to get a meaty problem with a bunch of unknowns that you have to go figure out, but it's even worse to sit around until you're spoon fed an Asana or Jira ticket spelling out exactly what you need to do. In fact, this is a pretty good way to approximate an engineer's level. Usually the fewer the instructions on the task, the more experienced, higher leveled and better paid the developer. Companies want go-getters. They want people who can take vague directions like our tests are flaky or our builds take too long or our AWS bill is too high. They're not told how to solve the problem, just what the problem is. It's on them to figure out the intricacies and make it happen. So how do you thrive in ambiguity? Well, the first step is to just accept it. Don't shy away from responsibility because you don't have all the answers. The truth is no one does. I used to think that I was a terrible engineer because I couldn't finish the entire project by myself and some god tier staff engineer could, but that's simply not the case. Leadership doesn't care how a project gets done. They just care that it's done on time without introducing too much tech debt. And the result is successful. 10X engineers spend a lot of time thinking and designing before ever touching a line of code. They talk to a lot of people and try to really understand what the problem is. And then they define a success criteria. Because remember, if the problem itself is vague, then what it means to be successful is murky too. For example, let's say leadership comes to us and says our AWS bill is too high. Well, we want to decrease it, obviously, but by how much? Anyone can make up a number and say we want it to go down by 50% per month, but is that a reasonable goal? Is it attainable? And more importantly, does it make sense? Maybe it's possible, but not at the cost of engineering time and effort. Everything has a price and the best engineers understand trade-offs. Once all the planning is done, the pros and the cons, the best engineers architect a robust system to cover all the important cases. No coding yet. All this is done on design docs and tech specs, which they then send out for feedback. They get all the relevant parties to comment, and once they have adequate buy-in, only then do they start coding, usually with a team of engineers. Secret number two, find problems. The best software engineers are independent. They can go find the biggest impact problems, convince leadership that they need to be solved, and then actually go solve them. Finding the highest yield problems in the first place is the true mark of a rockstar engineer. And they accomplish this by spending a little bit of time every day just exploring the code base, having casual one-on-ones with team members and poking around in the metrics. Their goal is to understand pain points. These can be technical bottlenecks or product shortcomings or even just things that give developers the ick, a word I learned quite recently. And then they surface these issues to the PMs or general leadership and they're often met with the same question. Okay, but why? You have to convince people that the thing you're trying to solve is one, an actual problem, and two, big enough of a pain point that we should prioritize. This isn't easy to do because engineering projects usually take months and are very costly because engineering time is expensive. So how do you get good on both these fronts? Finding and convincing. Well, for discoverability, you just have to put in the time. You need to read code and review PRs and venture into parts of the system that are foreign to you. Onboarding yourself and reading documentation, you'll have a fresh perspective. It's like that air freshener commercial where the person can't tell that their apartment stinks because they're there all day. Well, software is very similar. The more you interact with the system, the more biased you become. So a new perspective can make all the difference. As for convincing people and rallying them towards your mission, well, that just takes practice. You have to be persuasive. And in this day and age, data is king. So when you say something is slow, tell me by how much. And if something costs too much, then go find out what similar sized teams are paying and then prove to me that our spend is multiple times that. The more data you have in writing, the better your case will be. And of course, having heavyweight engineers backing you can only help your cause. Secret number three, become a subject matter expert. The top 1% of software engineers are the go-to people for certain aspects of a company. They're responsible for entire product lines and teams of engineers. And if something goes wrong, well, the buck stops with them. But how do you build so much trust? Well, if you paid attention to the first two secrets, then you're well on your way. By learning how to first find and then break down ambiguous problems into bite-sized chunks so you can make forward progress, you inevitably spend a lot of time in one area. And the deeper you go, the more complexities you unlock and the better you understand that system. And at some point, you've just spent more hours than any other person at the company. And so you know the most about that one thing, the goods, the bads, and the ugly. 
hopefully you don't hate the area you've now learned so much about because then you'd have to start from scratch somewhere else. The more you get invited to meetings and roped into discussions whenever your system is mentioned, the more people start associating you with that area. And if you're not already that person, well then start faking it till you make it. If something breaks, step in and volunteer to help investigate and fix it. If someone asks a question, instead of pointing them in the right direction, go figure out what the answer is and tell them. Don't find the right person for the job, become the right person for the job. Get in the weeds and find the answer. Top engineers don't wait to become experts. They just act like experts and then one day they become them. Doing all this takes time and the top 1% of engineers know how to be productive. One tool that stands out is Magical, a completely free Chrome extension used by over 500,000 people. A lot of you reach out to me with questions, so I've created a calendar link where you can grab some time to chat about whatever's on your mind. Since I get a lot of emails with Magical, I can respond with the click of a button. I've set up a template with placeholders so I can personalize each message, and then all it takes is dash cal 30 and I'm good to go. I also use it when recruiting. When hitting up people for coffee chats, I use Magical on LinkedIn. You can add a bunch of placeholders, everything from first name to company to so much more. So download Magical today with my special link in the description. Once again, it's 100% free. Now let's get back to some more tips. Secret number four, be customer obsessed. If you forget who you're building for, then you're not valuable at all. The best engineers are customer obsessed and leave their ego at the door. Just because you think something is cool and technically challenging doesn't mean we should go build it. You're trying to solve a real problem for real people. And though 99% of engineers understand this, they don't live it or breathe it. They think it's the product or the user experience team to understand the customer and figure out what we should build. But it's not. The best engineers are product minded. And this doesn't mean they're building a consumer app. Everything is a product. Even the gnarliest infra team or the backend developer experience team, they also have a customer. It just happens to be a technical person. While most engineers get their project done and then move on, the top 1% of engineers continue collecting feedback. They check in from time to time and understand how their customers are liking the product. Then they suggest improvements and go on to prioritize them. They realize that you can always do better and delighting customers is the best way to make more money, which means more recognition, and then that means better pay. Secret number five, don't over-engineer. Ideally, remembering that you're building products for a real person should stop you from over-engineering, but it doesn't always. As as a computer science enthusiast and a fellow software engineer, I love when my projects are hard and complex. I just wanna solve the most complex problems, so just leave me alone. But the truth is we only have so much time and resources and we can't build everything. And I remember going down the rabbit hole of trying to make something super abstract or over-engineering a system so it can scale to like hundreds of millions of users when really all I should be doing is building a simple form for a web page. Build for what you need now, and that doesn't mean be dumb and purposely make your life harder in the future, but don't plan months or years in advance. There's a lot of power in just shipping a feature and then iterating on it slowly. That's definitely better than spending an entire year developing something and then no one is using it. You'd rather put something out that has thousands of users and then slowly make it better. The biggest place amateurs fail is scale. They think that the real world is like a system design interview and that you should just throw CPUs and cores and expensive systems on a problem. The top 1% aren't the best coders. Strong programming fundamentals can definitely help, but it's not necessary. So if your goal is to become the top lead coder or a legendary grandmaster at Code Forces or even an international Olympiad gold medalist, well then I'm not your guy. I didn't even know you could earn these titles until like five minutes ago. The best software engineers simply build the best products in the time frame that they're given. They realize that there are real world constraints and you can always improve and iterate in the future. Also, you'll always introduce tech debt. There'll always be stuff you have to fix later and understanding and embracing that is a superpower. Secret number six, mentor others. Hopefully this one isn't a surprise because I'm sure the software engineers you look up to most have helped you in your own personal growth and career in some way. The best engineers give back and make the people around them better. It's what they're judged on because if you're not making your direct team more efficient, then what are you doing? Companies want multiple rockstar engineers and some are just born that way, but the majority of them are coached into that level. By spending time pairing with and getting feedback from superstar engineers, you start emulating their habits and behaviors and good industry conventions. It's like faking it till you make it, but you're not really faking anything. You're just copying until you get there. Mentorship can come in many different forms. It could be notes on a document or comments on a pull request or just 
career advice in a casual one-on-one. -on -one. But the true differentiators, that top echelon of software engineers, the top 1% of the 1%, they don't constrain their coaching only to the company. They believe that their brand should echo across the industry. And they do this through blogs and conferences and interviews. Secret number seven, understand business impact. If these layoffs have taught you anything, it's that companies only care about their bottom line. Increasing the bottom line means more profit, which means more money back to shareholders. People often think that engineers should be shielded from the intricacies of making money. That's for the product and finance teams, right? Wrong. The top 1% of engineers embrace the numbers and align themselves with projects that will move the needle. The joke at Google used to always be that the fastest way to get promoted was by getting on projects that would ship and make a big impact, even if they failed. It's the reason there've been so many messaging apps from Google. Hangouts and meets and allo. Part of succeeding is having people in your corner and there's nothing that brings people together like money. Spending time understanding the money printing machines at a company and how to improve margins or create new business lines is the best way to make a splash. Secret number eight, improve culture. And last but not least, rockstar engineers improve a company in more ways than just engineering and product. They drive culture. They run hackathons and write blog posts and organize conferences. And they even make the interview process better. They understand that the only way to scale a company is by working on its culture. Good culture is the best way to attract great talent. If you think of two of the best engineers out there, Jeff Dean and Sanjay Gamawat, they've built some insane products at Google, but their reputation is so much more than that. They've mentored hundreds, if not thousands of engineers, improved culture, as well as technical initiatives like code processes and testing. And they've worked on projects that have directly increased Google's market cap. I'm not a top 1% engineer, I'm nowhere close, but by emulating the behaviors of the very best software engineers, I'll eventually get there and so will you. That's all I have, till next time, cheers.